This is the ninth video in a series devoted to abstract algebra. And today we're gonna to look at something called a coset. So let's jump right into the definition. So let's suppose we have a group G. This could be any group, abelian or non-abelian. Then we also have a subgroup of G, which we will call H and an element of G, which we will call little g. So these are the parts to build this notion of a coset. Okay, then the left coset of H with representative G is defined to be the following set. So our notation is this GH, but really that's just all G multiples of elements of H we are where we are multiplying from the left. And that's what I have here encoded in this set builder notation. This is G times H as H runs through everything from H. And then likewise, we could define something called the right coset, which is all right multiples of elements of H by G. And like I said, that will be HG, where that's the set containing all little h times little g as H runs through all H. And I'd like to point out here in general that right cosets are not generally equal to the corresponding left coset. And that's because generally we don't have commutativity in groups. But we will see cases when these are equal even outside of abelian groups. And that'll actually be a really special case of a subgroup. Okay, so anyway, we've got GH is in general not equal to HG. Okay, so now let's look at some examples. Maybe this first example, which gives us motivation behind this whole notion of a coset in the first place, is built out of even and odd numbers. So let's say that G is the additive group of integers, and then H is the cyclic group generated by the number two. So let's recall that we wrote that as two times Z, and that was simply all even numbers. And we talked before why that forms a subgroup, but since it's a cyclic subgroup, it's obviously a subgroup. But I'd like to notice that this is maybe its own coset with multiplication by the identity. I shouldn't say multiplication here, operation by the identity. Our operation is addition. But since if we add any even number to an element of H, we land back in H, we actually have, this is the coset connected to any even number. And let's notice here that I'm using the plus symbol because we have plus as our operation. So for abstract groups, we'll just put them next to each other and read it as multiplication. But if we know the operation, we'll use that operation. And in general, that most of the time will be when we have addition. Let's also notice that one plus H will be the set containing everything in H plus one. But that'll give us negative three, negative one, one, three, so on and so forth. In other words, all odd numbers. But that's the same coset as the coset with any odd number plus H, just by the structure of H. Okay, so we have H is the subgroup of all even numbers, and its only coset is the odd numbers. It's no longer a subgroup, though. So this sort of look at cosets is really a generalization of breaking groups into even and odd parts. But we may have more than just two parts. It may be more than just even and odd. And in the integers, you can think of it kind of like congruence mod n, but we wanna push it farther than the integers to general groups. Okay, so let's look at another illustrative example. So let's take g to be equal to s3, and then we'll take H to be the cyclic subgroup generated by the two cycle one, two. So that will contain the following two elements, the identity and one, two. Now, if we were to do our calculations and calculate the left coset of one, three H, we would get one, three, one, two, three. And I'll let you calculate that out, but that's what you get if you left multiply one, three and one, two you get one, two, three. But that's the same thing as the left coset um, with representative one, two, three. So let's notice that two cosets can be equal with different representatives. That's why we've used the word representative here. 
Then the left coset associated to 2, 3 is the following set. So 2, 3, we get that from multiplying 2, 3 into the identity. And 1, 3, 2, we get that from multiplying 2, 3 into 1, 2. That's the same thing as the left coset of 1, 3, 2 as well. But we have right cosets as well, which can be calculated similarly. Maybe I'll let you think about how these could be calculated, maybe work the details out on your own. The most important thing to notice is that this right coset attached to 1, 3 is not equal to the left coset connected to 1, 3. They both contain 1, 3, but they do not contain the same 3 cycle. Likewise, the right coset contained containing 1, 2, 3 is not equal to the left coset with representative 1, 2, 3. They have the same 3 cycle, but not the same 2 cycle. So that's interesting. But now let's just restrict our minds just to left cosets or in parallel just to right cosets. And let's notice that the group itself is both a left and a right coset where the representative is 1. And the cosets, we should maybe read this as either just the left cosets or just the right cosets, are seem to be disjoint and they seem to union to the whole group. So let's look at the left cosets. We have this one right here, which nominally is attached to the identity. We have this one right here and this one right here. And notice that these sets are disjoint. They do not contain any of the same elements but they union to the whole group. So this will be something that we prove later. Okay, let's do a couple more examples. Here are three more examples before we start proving general results. So let's take the group G to be D4, the symmetries of the square, and we'll take H to be the cyclic subgroup generated by R. That's all rotational symmetries. Let's recall that that will be E, R, R squared, and R cubed because R to the fourth is back to the identity. Then let's notice that SH, that coset, will be equal to S, SR, SR squared, and SR cubed. That's all of the reflections. It does not form a subgroup though because the identity is not in there. But that's the same thing as the right coset HS. And that's simply because of the commutation rules. Notice that R squared S is the same thing as SR squared. And then after that, we have like some nice commutativity, like for instance, R cubed S is the same thing as SR, and RS is the same thing as SR cubed. So things get swapped around a little bit. So this is an example of a non-abelian group and a subgroup where we in fact do have equality between the same corresponding left and right coset. So like I said, that's going to be an important type of subgroup that we'll talk about in the next video. Okay, so for our next example, this is maybe one of my favorite examples because it's nice and graphical. Let's take G to be the multiplicative group of complex numbers. And then let's take H to be the circle group. So the notation for that is S1, but let's just recall that that is everything of the form e to the i theta, where theta runs through all real numbers. Recall that e to the i theta by Euler's formula is cosine theta plus i sine theta. So that puts it into the complex plane. Okay, we'll notice that H itself is a circle of radius 1. This is essentially the per parameterization of a circle inside of the complex plane. If we multiply everything in H by 2, that expands the circle, and that would be the coset 2H. If we multiply everything in H by a half, that will contract the circle, and that'll be the coset 1 half H. But actually the number two here is not super important. You could take any element of the complex numbers with modulus two. For instance, this is the same thing as two i times h. That's because two i has modulus two. And also the square root of two times one plus i times h. Because that number, the square root of two times one plus i, also has modulus two. So in fact, anything along this circle could serve as a representative for the coset. Okay, 
So now let's look at one last example, and that would be to take G equal to Z8, and then we'll take H to be the cyclic subgroup generated by four. So that means it contains zero and four. Four plus four is equal to eight, which is equal to zero inside of Z8. And then we've got three more cosets after the identity coset, which is the subgroup. We have one plus H, which is one and five, two plus H, which is two and six, three plus H, which is three and seven. Okay, so I think this is looking good. Now let's look at a general result. Now we've got one of the most important results involving cosets. It's so important that we'll prove it here, but I implore you to, after we prove it here, to close your notes if you're taking notes, and then try to prove it on your own without re-watching the video or taking notes. It's really important to kind of understand the tricks that we'll use in this proof. So like I said, this is a proof that maybe all math majors should be able to just come up with after they've taken an abstract algebra class. Okay, so let's see what we have. Let's suppose that G is a group, H is a subgroup of G, and then X and Y are elements of G. And what this theorem is about is when cosets are equal. So we saw that cosets with different representatives were equal already. Okay, so then we have the following five statements are equivalent. So the first is the coset XH is equal to the coset YH. And then next is the right coset HX inverse is equal to the right coset HY inverse. Next is that the coset XH is a subset of the coset YH. So that's on its face pretty interesting that that is equivalent to equality. We have containment is equivalent to equality. Next is that Y is an element of the coset XH. And finally, we have X inverse Y is an element of H. Okay, so let's get to the proof and we'll do this proof with a looping action. We'll prove one implies two, two implies three, three implies four, four implies five, and then finally five implies one. And that will show that they're all equivalent. Okay, so anyway, let's get to one implies two. So let's suppose that XH is equal to YH, and then our goal is to show that these right cosets are equal. So HX inverse is equal to HY inverse. And how do we show two sets are equal? Well, by double set containment. So that means we need to take an element G inside of the left one and show that it's inside of the right one. So we've got G inside of HX inverse. And then our goal is to get G inside of H, Y inverse. That would show the subset relationship. Okay, so anyway, let's get to it. This tells us that G is equal to little h times X inverse for a little h inside of H. Okay, but now what we'd like to do from here is somehow get the element of H to the right. And we wanna get the element of H to the right because then we can use this fact that we know about left cosets. So let's invert this equation. So that tells us that G inverse equals X times H inverse. Remember we applied the shoes and socks theorem to this right side. That rule about how inverses affect the order of multiplication. Okay, but now let's notice that this is equal to X times something in H. We know H inverse is in H because H is a subgroup. So this is inside of the coset XH but that coset XH is equal to the coset YH by our assumption. But what does that mean? That means that little g inverse is equal to Y times a new H, maybe we'll call this H naught, for H naught inside of H. That's what it means to be inside that left coset YH. But now we'd like to invert this again and see what that leaves us with. So let's invert this and we'll get H not inverse Y inverse over there on the right hand side. That's because G inverse inverse is just G. Oh, but now this is an element from H 
Remember, H naught is an H, so H naught inverse is an H because we have a subgroup. This is an element of H times Y inverse, but that is the entry fee to be inside of H Y inverse. Okay, so let's see what we got. We started here with G is inside of H X inverse, and we ended here with G is inside of H Y inverse. So those red underlines imply that H X inverse is a subset of H Y inverse. Okay, then we also have to show that H Y inverse is a subset of H X inverse, but I'll leave that for you because it is exactly similar. So similarly, H Y inverse is a subset of H X inverse. And that's essentially because X and Y are playing symmetric rules in or symmetric roles in this setup. So now these two things together give us equality of these right cosets. So we've got H X inverse is equal to a H Y inverse, but that's exactly this two. So that proves the statement one implies two. And now let's move on to two implies three. So let's see, we'll need to start with this statement right here and end with this statement right here. So let's suppose that H X inverse is equal to H Y inverse as right cosets and that we have a little g inside of X H. Okay. And then our goal is to get that little g inside of yh. And that'll prove this subset relationship that we need. But this is gonna be essentially the same as we did before, except there's no reverse direction to do. That's because we just need set containment in this case. Okay, so what does it mean for little g to be in xh? Well, that means that little g is equal to xh for some little h inside of h. But now we'd like to get x inverse involved because we wanna use this given. So let's maybe invert this thing. That'll give us g inverse equals h inverse x inverse, but that's the shape of something inside of h x inverse. So that means this is inside of the right coset h x inverse. But by our assumption, that's equal to the right coset H Y inverse. But G inverse being inside of that coset means that we can write it in the following form. We have G inverse is equal to H naught times Y inverse for some H naught in H. Now we're gonna invert this thing and essentially be done. So inverting, we'll get G is equal to Y times H naught inverse. But that's Y times something in H, again, because H is a subgroup. So this is inside of the left coset YH. Okay, so let's see. We started right here with G is in XH, and we ended right here with G is in YH. So that starting and ending point tells us that XH is a subset of YH. But that's exactly where we needed to go for this number three. And now we're ready for three implies four. So let's suppose that we have this setup right here. We have XH is a subset of YH. And then our next goal is to show that little y is inside of x times h. But let's see, we can't immediately do this the way that we did before because we had subset relations that in these previous set steps. We wanna show that an element y is inside of this coset xh. So that means we've gotta do something different here. Maybe the most important starting point will be to notice that since H is a subgroup, we have the identity is inside of H, which tells us that X, which is equal to X times the identity, is inside of the coset XH. So we're guaranteed to have the element X inside of its coset. Okay, but now we assumed that XH was a subset of YH. So what does that mean? Well, following this from the left 
to the right, we see that X is an element of YH. Let's like recall we have that element right there. What does that mean? That means that we can rewrite X as little y times H for some little h in H. That's what it means to be in that coset. And now from here, we'll just write multiply by H inverse. Now, right multiplying by h inverse will give us, let's see, will give us y equals x h inverse. I swapped the order of the equality there, but that's okay because equality is symmetric. So just to reiterate, I write multiplied by h inverse, and that's going to kill the h here and give us x h inverse. But since h is a subgroup, h inverse is an h, so that means this is an element of x h, that coset. But that's exactly where we wanted to end up with for this number four. Now, moving on to number four, we want to start with y is an element of x h and prove that x inverse h is an element of h. This is another pretty quick one. So let's suppose that we have our assumption y is an element of x h but that means that y is equal to x times little h for some little h in h. And then we can write multiply by x inverse on both sides, and that's gonna give us x inverse times y is equal to h. But h was inside of h. So now we have x inverse times y inside of h as needed. Now, in this case, before moving on, to the next and last bit, I'd like to prove that there are some equivalent statements here that are also fairly useful. Like this is the same thing as x, y inverse is in h. And that doesn't follow from number four, but through like an equivalent symmetric argument, we can land at something like this. Also, we could maybe see immediately that y inverse x is in h and a number of different things. Okay, so let's just keep in mind that these are also equivalent to xh being equal to yh, even though we would have to like prove them in parallel, but the proofs are so similar that we're not going to worry about it. Now let's move on to the final part of this loop that five, five implies one. So to finish our looping argument, we will now prove that statement five implies statement one. So let's maybe get started. Let's suppose that X inverse Y is an element of H, but let's notice that that's the same thing as saying that X inverse Y equals little h inside of big H. Okay, but then now we want to prove that these two cosets are equal, and we'll do that by double set containment again. So let's also maybe take an element G from XH, and we'd like to end with G being inside of YH, and we'll use this fact along the way. Okay, so let's maybe get to it. So this means that little g is equal to x times h naught for h naught inside of h. So we've got something like that. But now let's go up here to our kind of given statement and invert it to something that's a little bit more helpful here. This is equivalent to saying that y inverse times x is equal to h inverse, but that's the same thing as saying that x is equal to y times h inverse. But now let's replace this x with that y over there. And that's gonna give us g is equal to y h inverse times h naught. But then we can reassociate to give us h inverse times h naught. And then because h is a subgroup, we know this is an element of h, so that means this whole thing is an element of y h. So let's see, I think we've done one direction. We started here with g is in x h and we ended with g is in y h. Okay, so now let's do the other direction. So now let's suppose that G is an element of YH, but that means that G is equal to Y times little h, maybe we'll call it one, for H1 in H. But now we can simply replace Y with X times H, given just left multiplying this by X. So let's do that. 
This is gonna be x times h times h1, which is x times h times h1, which is clearly in the coset xh. So let's see, we started with g is in yh, and we ended with g is in xh. So this string of orange inclusions gives us one set containment that xh is a subset of yh, and then this string of red arguments give us, gives us the other inclusion. So yh is a subset of xh. So putting these together, we see that xh is equal to yh, which is exactly what's needed to finish this proof off. Now we're gonna prove a result that we alluded to earlier, and that is that the cosets of a subgroup partition a group. Well, what do I mean by partition a group? Well, that's a fancy way to say that the cosets of a subgroup are disjoint and they union to the whole group. Okay, so let's first prove that they are disjoint. So let's suppose we have two elements X and Y inside the group such that the coset with representative X intersect with the coset with representative Y is non-empty. Okay, so if it's non-empty, then what we should be aiming for is that this means that the two cosets are the same. And that will prove that the cosets are either disjoint or they are the same. I guess like here I'm proving this for left cosets, but in complete parallelity, you could prove this for right cosets as well, but I won't do that here. Okay, so like I said, let's suppose that happens, but if that's non-empty, we can take an element little g inside of their intersection. Well, that's what it means for them to be non-empty. They contain at least one element. Okay, but let's notice that means that we can write g as a multiple of x, so x times h1, and we can also write it as a multiple of y. Let's say y times h2, and h1 and h2 are elements of h. Okay, nice. But now let's focus on this equation that we've just built involving x and y. And let's maybe try to mold it into something we saw on the previous board. Let's left multiply by x inverse, and perhaps we'll right multiply by h2 inverse. So that's gonna give us x inverse y equals h1 h2 inverse. Again, by the appropriate left and right multiplications that I described verbally. But this is a combination of things in H, so that means it's inside of H as well because H is a subgroup. But now we've got X, y, X inverse Y is inside of H, but remember that was one of our equivalent statements to XH equals YH. And so now we've done it. This means that cosets are either equal to each other or they are disjoint. So if they contain one element in common, then they're the same coset. Okay, so now let's show that they union to G. Okay, and this is like really quick as well. So let's notice if we take the union over all X in G of the cosets XH, that's most definitely gonna be a subset of G. And why is that? Well, that's because XH itself is a subset of G. So if you union a bunch of subsets of G, you will get a subset of G. Now let's also notice that if little g is in g, but now we've got little g is inside of its own coset, gh, but its own coset is a subset of all of the union of the subsets. So this is a subset of the union over all x in g of xh. But that tells us that the group G is a subset of this union. So let's see. Let's see what we have put together. We have the union of the cosets is a subset of the group, and the group is a subset of the union of the cosets. So putting this together by double set inclusion, we know that those two have to be equal. So now let's move on to another result. Now we're going to look at the notion of the index of a subgroup. So let's look at our definition. So let's let G be any group 
and h is a subgroup of g. We'll define the index of h in g to be the number of left cosets of h in g, or the number of right cosets. And we're about to prove that those are the same numbers, so that makes this well-defined. Furthermore, we have the following notation. So I'll just read this as the index of h in g, but notice we've got these brackets, a g and an h and a colon. So that's the quick notation for the index of a subgroup. Okay, so let's see how the proof of this claim goes. So how do you prove that the number of elements in two sets are the same? Well, you do it by finding a bijection between these sets. So let's let L sub H be equal to everything of the form little g times H as G runs through all of G. So that's the set of all left cosets. And then in parallel, let's define RH is equal to, let's see, it'll be everything of the form HG where G runs through all of G. So it's all the right cosets. Now we'd like to find a bijection between these. So let's define the following map. So we'll call it F and it'll go from LH to RH. And what it'll do is it'll take a left coset, GH, and send it to a right coset. But the trick here is you can't send it to the right coset HG, you have to send it to the right coset HG inverse. Otherwise, this doesn't work out. Okay, so let's maybe notice first that cosets have different representatives. And anytime elements of the domain have different representatives, you must check that your map is well-defined. So I think we did this in a previous video. We checked that a map was well-defined. Like I said, that occurs when the same element of the domain has different names, which we saw was possible earlier in this case. Okay, so now let's suppose that we have XH is equal to YH with potentially different names. And what we'd like to do is show that they have the same output via this function. But we proved that big theorem that does all of the heavy lifting here. Notice that F evaluated at XH is equal to HX inverse. But given that XH and YH are the same by that theorem, that means that this is equal to HY inverse, which is equal to F of YH. That's exactly what we need for this thing to be well-defined. So we're good to go there. Now let's show that it is also injective. Okay, so how could we do that? Well, let's suppose that we have F of XH equals F of YH. And we wanna show that XH and YH are the same coset. But notice this immediately tells us that HX inverse is equal to HY inverse. But then, again, by those equivalent uh, statements of cosets being equal, this tells us that XH is equal to YH. But that's the injectivity rule there. Now we need to show that it's surjective as well, and that'll finish everything off. So how might we do that? Well, we just have to find a pre-image for something. But let's take an element um, which we'll call HG from the set of right cosets and find something that gets landed on it. Well, it's not too hard to see that if we take the left coset G inverse H, it'll land on HG. That's exactly what we need for this thing to be surjective. So we've shown that the number of left cosets is the same as the number of right cosets, which shows this idea of the index over here is well-defined. We can count left or right cosets and we get the same number. So let's look at a couple of examples of indexes real quick. So here are three examples of finding the index of a subgroup. The first will take our group G to the, be the group of units mod 15. So let's recall that we'll have eight elements because phi of 15 is eight. That's Euler's totient function. Then we'll take H to be the cyclic subgroup generated by two. That'll give us two to the zero, which is one, two to the one, two to the two, and two to the three. Notice two to the four is equal to 16, but that's equal to one in U15.
then let's take an element outside of H, maybe seven, and we'll multiply seven into each of these. And after reducing mod 15, we get seven, 14, 13, and 11. So those partition the group, which means those are all of the cosets. But there are exactly two cosets, so that means the index of G and H in this case is two. Now let's look at another example. Let's take G to be the integers and H to be the cyclic group generated by three under addition, three Z. So that's all multiples of three. Let's notice that one plus H will contain negative two, one, four, so on and so forth. 2 plus h will be negative 1, 2, 5, so on and so forth. But that's all of the cosets because all of the integers are contained in one of those sets. That means the index of g and h in this case is 3. So notice we've got an infinite group with a finite index. So I think that's interesting in itself. But notice we could also have an infinite group with an infinite index, and that's exhibited by this example. Let's take G to be multiplicative complex numbers, H to be the circle group, as we saw before. And notice for all positive real numbers, X and Y, the coset con uh, containing X is not equal to the coset containing Y. But there are clearly infinitely many positive real numbers. So that means we have infinitely many cosets, which means the index of H in G in this case is infinite. Now I'm gonna leave you with some warm-ups. Here are three nice warm-up exercises based on what we saw today. The first is to find all left cosets of the cyclic subgroup generated by the cycle one, two, three, four inside of S4. Next, let's find all left cosets of the cyclic subgroup generated by seven inside of U12. Then let's prove our big, the following our equivalent theorem from this video without notes. So I'd really like you to try to do this a couple of times until you can do it totally without notes. And I really think that'll help understand the ins and outs of coset arguments. And then finally, let's find examples of infinite groups with subgroups. Those subgroups can be finite or infinite such that we have either a finite index for the subgroup or an infinite index for the subgroup, or actually find an example of each, and maybe not the example that we saw on the previous board. And that's a good place to stop.